Hi. Ooh. Um, thank you, Peter and Adam, for being here tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, everyone, who made this happen. Um, I'm going to keep this very short. Um, that's kind of all I have to say. Peter Savile and Adam Ray. When we first spoke about coming up with the title, you kind of had immediately. So yeah. what does meaningless excitement mean to you? Why is it relevant for this topic? But it's just meaningless excitement. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> First of all, I'd just like to say how surprised I am that there's so many people here. <laughs> uh, I don't know, <laughs> Why is that surprising? <laughs> um, I did this once before, apparently in 2006. I was younger then. <laughs> anyway, so it, I'm very touched that so many people have turned up, so, especially on a cold night, so thank you. Um, meaningless excitement. I think it's because what was the brief? It was something about creative direction. Well, creative direction and also the the production of um, professionals that do creative work, so the work I, of creative direction. I, I mean, I, I can't take it seriously anymore. Um, I did take it seriously once when I was young and naive, but I don't take it particularly seriously now. Um, because professionally, you're engaged in quite a lot of... of, of you know, you'd have to call it gratuitous um, endeavor. Um, so I, I kind of felt that something slightly self-effacing uh, and um, meaningfully throwaway um, might be, you know, more appropriate than, than uh, a title of series. I, uh, subsequently, um, I thought that the title of The, the Cloud that we may talk about later, with the title being, uh, it looks like you've reached the end. Um, that might have been more appropriate, but maybe a little valedictory, so I, I think, perhaps I'm not ready for that yet. Um, so, Meanest Excitement, um, well, it's a title of a collection of textiles that I did for Yoji and Adidas when, uh, um, 2014, mm -hmm. and, um, I have a little bit of a kind of um, um, a factious relationship with Adidas. They 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 um, they do rather epitomise um, the kind of global harvesting of ideas, um, and they came to me. I don't know when. Earlier, some years previously, this meaningless this excitement was, I think, 2014. Adidas came to me, I don't know, maybe 2007 or 8 or something, and, and asked me to, to partake in um, a, a collection they were doing, which was a revival of a project they'd had, I think, in the 80s called Addy Color, where you've got a pair of white sports shoes. And, and a box of colored marker pens and you could paint your own pens, which I thought actually is quite a nice idea. And they, they, were, they were revisiting that idea and asking various people if they would um, do a kind of custom shoe. And they were allocating colors to each designer and they kindly allocated green to me um, and then gave me a, a brief uh, part of which detailed um, the characteristics and qualities of the color green. Hmm. They pointed out to me that green is associated with nature, which was <laughs> <laughs> very nice of them. Um, and it was early 2000s. And, and even then it seemed like a relatively pointless venture. Um, a kind of gratuitous creation of, of, of product. Um, and I didn't really want to do it. And, um, and they said, well, please come and discuss it. And it was interesting to go to, to Germany, to Hersena Gowerak, to the, the Adidas factory. And that was, so I said, okay. So, so I went there and had a conversation with them. Um, and what did I say? Um, I said, I'll, I'll, 
I'll do this if you let me do whatever I want. And they said, that's the idea, do whatever you want. So I said, I'd like to do nothing at all. Um, <laughs> and, but there is one very interesting thing about this uh, invitation, which is the brief itself. And I would quite like to print the brief uh, and put it on the wrapping paper with a shoe. Mm. At which they, you know, they're... they're their heads sunk and, and um, uh, they thought, oh, fuck. Um, but having invited me to do whatever I wanted, they said, okay, fine, we'll do it. Um, so I did a plain white shoe with, with as little marking uh, and branding as possible and, and included the ephemera of the brief and the and notion of green being associated with nature and other things in the shoe. And um, anyway, so, so this was the beginning of this slightly kind of... Um, not a love-hate, but a slightly sort of testy relationship between Adidas and I. And then, so some years later, uh, they had a Y3 collection to do, and the ideas for the garments had not come through from Tokyo, from Yoji, and they thought it might act as a catalyst for the collection itself if somebody addressed the problem of the, the, the textiles uh, and the, the photographic printing on textiles developments meant that um, they could come to someone like me to come up with some ideas for, for the textiles. Um, and again, I didn't really want to do it um, because I couldn't really believe in the, in the importance of it. Um, but it, it was associated with the Yoji, and, and I have had a long and a very um, kind of respectful relationship with Yoji. He has always supported me uh, when I wanted to um, question the way of things. Um, and I said, okay, let me think about it. And it's kind of difficult when you're trying to think of an idea for something that you don't really believe in the purpose of doing. Um, and I was, I was on the train one morning going to Manchester. Um, and I was working with the city council. And I was reading The Guardian and um, Tarantino's Django Unchained had just come out. And I was reading a review of that. And, um, and somewhere in the review, the, the writer just said it was Tarantino's usual recipe of meaningless excitement. And this phrase, meaningless excitement, suddenly sort of jumped off the page and kind of inflated in my mind. And I thought, okay, well, that sort of summarizes so much of what is going on at the moment and so much of what companies and organizations are, are, are generating. It's a sort of cycle of, of meaningless excitement. Um, and I liked it. So I, I got in touch with Adidas and I said, okay, I'll do it. Can I call the collection meaningless excitement? <laughs> it was similar to the, the shoe response. Um, and they were a little bit uncertain. They were obviously a little bit uh, wary about that, but they said, we'll speak to Yoji. And of course, Yoji gave it a thumbs up immediately because he likes to <laughs> undermine the system. So um, so, so it was, the collection was called Meaningless Excitement and, and, and it was culled. The reference and the material from it was culled from, the kind of the, the ephemera of the internet that, that now seems some time ago, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was a certain kind of painful novelty to the stuff that you would encounter, you know, every hour or whenever you went to search for something or the emails that you were constantly receiving. And it was just cold, <clears throat> it was cold from. Um, I don't know from the kind of atomized contents of the cloud. So this was this collection now is almost ten years ago, but evidently you still feel the the term is is, is relevant. More so the today. The thing is how <laughs> the horrible thing or the shocking thing is how relevant it still is. Hmm. And and uh, and you know, and it just goes on. Yeah. The the interesting thing about doing something with with the big 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 companies is that even even when there's something kind of questioning or slightly you know we're critical of the system, um, it's a little bit like the the monster in uh, in Forbidden Planet. The more you throw at it, the greater it becomes. So in some way, every time I've kind of playfully teased a company like Adidas, they just seem to absorb it and and get stronger from it. So. Well, I mean, is this to me? It's, it strikes me that this is, in fact, sort of like the essential 
dynamic that powers fashion. Yes. Um, that seems uh, to have an endless capacity, as you say, to recuperate and regurgitate. Yeah, and every, I mean, every year you think this must, it must have reached some sort of limit, and yet it doesn't seem to. We've been talking about this for several years, it yeah. like a reached limit. And the, the, I mean, it does surprise me how many people are, I'm not even going to say interested, how, how the extent to which people are curious about it. Hmm. About fashion, specifically, or...? Well, it's not really fashion, is it? It's just kind of the, a kind of a, a, a repeating news cycle of novelty, hmm. and, it, and it encompasses everything. Hmm. So, so we've got a talk called "Meaningless Excitement," and a room full of people. <laughs> a room full of people <laughs> who want to listen to it. So, what can I say? Right. <laughs> Well, so, uh, but the, your relationship with, with uh, sticking with fashion in particular has not always been this, um, well, perhaps it's always been critical, perhaps you've always viewed it critically, but m my understanding is that in initially, you know, you, you, you first became well known as a designer for your work with Factory, your work in yeah. the sphere of music, but I, but I believe it was fashion that was originally was, more that... I mean, as all old people say, it was different then. Um, <laughs> But it was. It was different. It was. I mean, let me put that in a more. Context. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's. Uh, it's too much of an old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, um, I was a young person once, um, and and obviously it felt different. Hmm. So you know, it probably you know, as it certainly feels different for every you know subsequent generation of young people. Hmm. Um, I think also that's that's one of the things that you know traditionally people have tended to forget as they get older that that you know there's a <clears throat> there's always a new generation for whom everything is 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 fresh and start you know and it sort of mm. starts over again. So you know, as a teenager in the late sixties into the seventies. I was, I was more tuned in. I was more tuned into the look of things than necessarily the sound of things. Hmm. So you know, I had a understandable and, and, and normal relationship to music, but I was not particularly orientated or obsessive about music. But the record cover was you know, a, a singular and particular form of, of visual communication for young people that did not have really have any, any um, um, alternative, any counterpoint. Um, the, the record cover was the, the, a medium through which you became aware of um, new visual ideas mm. and also visual ideas that can, connected you to other people, other like-minded people. So, so whenever you whenever you looked at a record cover, you were you know you were kind of aware that you know hundreds, maybe thousands of other young people like you were looking at it. So it was you know kind of early kind of communication system, and and um, and there was no alternative. Obviously, there's no point for me. There's no need for to mention internet, the television, and the media. I mean, th there was no um, significant form of visual communication for young people uh, or that was in any way avant-garde or different or progressive, other than the record sleeve. Um, and and if you were if you hadn't had the benefit of being brought up in a kind of particularly cultured or art-aware family, record sleeves were you know were your connection to to uh, the visual world. And so record sleeves mattered to me. Mm. So. Music to a certain extent, and there was always certain music that I was a bit obsessive about, but I was never, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not obsessed with music and I never really was, but the record sleeve was important. Um, and amongst my visually aware friends that I was at school with, uh, some of whom I then went to art school with, um, we saw record sleeves independent of the music, so, mm -hmm. so that you, could, you would talk about sleeves without necessarily being affiliated to the, to the music that they were representing. Um, so I 
you know, I have kind of had this um, fixation before I left grammar school um, that I wanted to be involved in the creation of visual work. Uh, and the record sleeve was the obvious first destination for that. Mm. Uh, I had a close friend I was at school with called Malcolm Garrett and he felt the same. And so we got directed to art college to study graphic design because our teacher told us, if you want to do that, you better go study graphic design. So we didn't really know what graphic design was. This was 1974, but we knew what record sleeves were. So we went to college to learn how to make record sleeves. Right. Um, Malcolm and I were both reasonably bright and we realized quite quickly that there was more to graphic design than that. Then we realized uh, and that it was a, a service a service occupation um, to do with communications uh, and we thought well um, that will probably be interesting when we're 40 or something but you know right here right now um, there's something we want to do um, and you know it was serendipity that the punk happened in the period between 74 and 78 when Malcolm and I were at art college so there was a kind of coup d'etat in the youth culture that we were part of and there was a momentary change of guard and there was an opportunity in 77 78 to be immediately involved in what seemed to be something important that was happening so we you know it was we didn't have to wake and await any kind of apprenticeship to get an opportunity to make work we had the opportunity to make work before we even left college mm. Manchester in 77 78 um, was a productive place to connect with the independent music scene so Malcolm worked with the Buzzcocks and, and I got involved with Tony Wilson and the, the founding of what became Factory Records. I'm fascinated by what you say about uh, the, when you were a teenager, the the record sleeve often uh, you know lived independently from the music yeah. that it went with. Um, I think you know when you think about a young person encountering music, then it was probably people who listened to Joy Division and mm. encountered your work, and for quite some time they lived with the music without even knowing necessarily what the band looked like. And that is, I don't think. Uh, the dynamic has, has really changed. Um, and people encounter uh, artists as uh, not necessarily celebrities, but, but figures mm. who um, have personalities and they attach to personalities more so than perhaps the, yeah. the album art. It, it, it seems... Well, the, 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 circumstance, <clears throat> the circumstances at Factory were kind of quite unique. Um, really, nobody involved wanted to be a pop star apart from perhaps me and Tony Wilson. Um, I think Tony, <laughs> and look at the crowd. Right I think, yeah, I think, exactly. I think Tony and I had bigger egos and were more vain than any of the people in any, in any of the groups. Um, but it was an independent venture, so it, was, it, would, it happened outside of the, commercials, the commercial remit of music. So, sure. um, and anybody who's, who started with Factory and stayed have made a decision to stay outside of the music business. Mm. Uh, and that's what happened with Joy Division and then as New Order when they continued after Joy Division. Um, the the unique circumstances of Factory um, were that n nobody involved had any previous experience at all. So nobody involved presumed to tell anybody else how they should go about their contribution. Um, nobody was being paid. So everybody did what they wanted to do, the way they felt like doing it. Mm. Um, so Tony, I mean, rather wonderfully, Tony Wilson created a kind of platform <laughs> upon which individuals who wished to be involved could step up and do what they wanted to do the way they wanted to do it. Mm. Um, so the whole thing had a degree of kind of almost adolescent idealism about how young people, even though we were not actually that young, but how young people imagine the music business is and how it, you know, it's not at all like that. Um, but it, we, we went about factory the way that teenagers like to imagine um, music industry is. Mm. Um, 
And remarkably, it worked. It worked for nearly 15 years, yeah. including opening a club, the way kids <laughs> imagine you run a club. Um, and um, so everyone was free to make their contribution as they saw fit. So that's perhaps best best example of that, Martin Hannett, the producer. Um, you know, he produced Unknown Pleasures for the Joy Division album. Um, the group came in, they recorded their parts, and Martin told them to fuck off, and he had a record to make. And to this day, you know, Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook don't really like Unknown Pleasures. It was not the record they thought they were going to make. Um, but Martin was making the record, so it was Martin's record. Mm -hmm. So, and the same, the same, that same um, kind of liberty and autonomy um, applied to me as well. Yeah. Um, for unknown pleasures they gave me some elements and said we would like this and I went away and did the best I could to do a record slip yeah. and it went to the printers what? No, one, no one approved it no one saw it and no one approved it I, I, there were certain things I couldn't figure out I couldn't figure out how to put the name of the group on the front that looked kind of cliched mm. um, I couldn't really put the title of the album on the front because that made it look like a record sleeve um, so I left all of those things off and nobody seemed to care yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to hear more about how you you know you say that, that you were free to make the contributions that you felt were were right yeah. how did you do develop this this sensibility that you brought to well to I did I mean with un, un, no place is a good example because I remember the kind of fear and anxiety I had the night I was doing it um <laughs> Relevant for a few people in the yeah, room. I mean, I it was, you know, I mean, it was just a few. I mean, it was less than a year after I'd left college. No one teaches you how to do anything at art school, <laughs> practically. I mean, maybe it's a little bit different now, but I don't think it's that different. And particularly if you're studying graphics, no one actually tells you how to do something. Hmm. They talk about it, but not actually how to do it. So, so you know, you don't actually know how to produce anything. The actual craft of the discipline is rather left to the individual to learn or to have an assistant job somewhere and pick it up. Hmm. <clears throat> so I had no idea what I was doing. Fortunately, <clears throat> fortunately, they wanted the cover in black and white. That was good because <clears throat> I could only do black and white, so that wasn't good. Um, and the, the important thing is this. I, um, I realize, in retrospect, that I made the cover that I wanted to have. Hmm. So I didn't exactly do what I wanted to do. I did what I wanted to have. Hmm. And, and in that, we just get back to the beginning about fashion <laughs> um, I always saw um, fashion music and kind of entry level art you know like as a teenager I understood well, no, I didn't understand it I, I thought I liked pop art mm -hmm. you know it's very easy for teenagers to think they understand pop they don't really understand it but they it's easy to like mm -hmm. And um, I saw all of these things in a kind of collective. I sort of joined the dots between these different things. Mm. And, and I looked for the connections between them. And I kind of thought everyone did that. But it seems they didn't really. Mm. You know, I, I, at college, I was with people studying graphics, 100 other people doing graphics. And they were kind of like, they just were focused on graphics. And they didn't look very much beyond that discipline. Yeah. And you meet people in fashion and they focus on fashion. They don't, traditionally, they didn't look very much beyond the boundaries of fashion, et cetera, et cetera. And art, as for art, they, you know. And that seems to really no longer be the case. It's not really. I mean, deep inside the discipline of those uh, deep, deep, in, deep inside the specific discipline, yes, there is, a, there is in a way, a hard shell of... <coughs> The, the, the values and more than anything the well the, the, the academia and the business of the discipline mm. but but around it is a much more kind of um, amorphous zone now where everything crosses over um, it crosses over uh, uh, in a way that I mean Jack self who was here um, previous previous years Jack referred to as the big flat now um, and I liked that expression a lot um, I think I referred to it once as a sort of the disco ball all of everything and Jack 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 distilled it down to the big flat now um, as 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 um, as a condition 
in our times now where the basically you know the the what used to be talked about high and low culture where the where the the landscape of high and low has leveled out a lot where the where the boundaries between the disciplines have blurred to the point where you can't see the distinction anymore mm -hmm. and and um you know i feel very much that we are kind of traversing the big flat now yeah. you know at the very heart of fashion at the very heart of art at the very heart of communication design at the heart of architecture there is a serious core of rigor mm. but in the look of things and in the shared kind of vernacular of ideas mm. there's a lot of hybridity and interpollination and crossover between things and um, that's how I always used to see it mm. so I didn't see a record cover as a record cover I saw it as an image an image in contemporary culture that that I was interested by or or wanted. So that, I mean, the best example of it is Power Corruption Lies, the New Order cover from 1983 with the Fantan the Tall Roses on the front. Um, I, I, I didn't suggest that we get that, but it's like that for me was the you know that that's like a quintessential example of kind of the convergence, the com how I saw the convergence between things. Mm. It's a very fashion-related cover. How so? Indeed, how so? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make you earn that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I picked up the postcard by chance in the National Gallery one afternoon when I went to look for Machiavellian portrait. For Power Corruption Lies, I, I went to look for a portrait of a Machiavellian character. Found some and was disappointed with the triteness of my own idea. <laughs> <laughs> Left via the gift shop, as is my want, and... Well, they don't give you much choice. No, that's true. <laughs> um, but I always do that in, in galleries and museums. Um, a kind of a resume of some of what I saw and some of what I didn't see. Mm. And sometimes I used to just uh, buy postcards on impulse, and then look at them the next day to ask myself, why did I choose these? Hmm. Anyway, that afternoon, I quite deliberately took the Fantan Latour postcard off the shelf because I liked it and it sort of chimed with something that some, I had two very good friends called Scott Crowell and Georgina Godley and they had a shop on Dover Street in the early 80s. And Georgina was using Sanderson's upholstery fabrics as a kind of, uh, to make dress summer dresses, as a kind of ironic <sighs> reference back to flower power. So she was, it was basically a flower, it was, an, it was a neo 60s, early 80s flower power quote, but ironically through chintz through sanderson's rather than let's say a kind of mary quant flower mm. and which i thought was very cool and so um so i saw the fantan latour and, and i took it um because i liked it and it just sort of echoed this this moment that someone was making me think about and martha ladley my girlfriend uh, at the time was with me and she saw me hold it again and she said you're not thinking of that for power corruption lies are you and i said no of course not and i went fucking hell yes of course i am um, yes it was so it was so it was so perfectly um um so it was such a perfect foil to the title it was so perfectly contrary to the title and 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 it was so seductive and it seemed to me suddenly a far better way to represent power and corruption than than uh, the Mr. Machiavelli. Mm. So, um, so, so that came together. That came together from these different places, yeah. and uh, with a kind of sense for me of nowness. And um, I suppose that's what what I've always been trying to do. Um, is to 
it is to create or to show, perhaps to show some sense of nowness about a thing I'm having to create or communicate about. Mm. And, and if, I, if I can't find any pertinence to the now in something, um, I try to avoid doing it. That's not always the case, needs must. So sometimes I've had to do things to pay the rent, which really were not pertinent really in any way. But, but that's, um, that's what I try to do when I get asked about something. And it's, it's become very diverse the last 20 years, the things I get asked about. Mm. Um, and, um, and I always, you know, I ask myself, what is that about this? this product, this service, this city, which I can connect to some sense of nowness or some urgence or some relevance in the now and then eke out that thing. Hmm. It seems like you're, you're quite driven by, um, by intuition. You, you picked the postcard because you liked it. You created the record cover because you wanted to have it. Do you feel the need to then like post facto justify the work? Yeah, I mean, it's all kind of indulgent. I mean, you know, uh, if we come back to the reality of graphic design, which is essentially communications design, it's not really about you. It's not about the individual. Yeah. Which was the thing about it that I didn't really like. And I'm not very good at that. <laughs> um, I, I actually admire and impressed by, you know, professional communications designers now who are able to distance themselves from that sort of um, that s the sense of person in the work and do what's right for the work regardless. And I have never had the modesty to do that. I mean, I, I can see how you do it. I just don't really want to do it. And very foolishly, see myself in the work and this is a, probably a terrible handicap to have but maybe it goes back to those record covers hmm. you know i would look at record covers and then we would look to see who did them so we would associate the person who did the cover with with what they'd done hmm. so uh, and 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 with a lot of graphic work you don't sign it you know your name isn't there but with so much of what i was doing my name was there so i would I would feel that what I'd done was a representation of me, so therefore I didn't want to do things that I couldn't identify with. Hmm. Um, fortunately, in recent years, people have actually come to me asking for something of myself in the work. Hmm. But there was a tricky period in the 90s when no one came at all, you know, um, because, because um, I, you know, I, I was, it, it was incumbent upon me to do professional work in a professional way and I didn't really want to do it. Hmm. But unfortunately, the last 10, 15 years, um, people come to me knowing of me and, and, and in a way asking that I try to instill some of myself in, in, in their project. Mm. Well, l let's talk about a recent one then. You, yeah. you, in 2018, I believe, um, worked with Ricardo Tishi, who had just taken yeah. over yeah. Uh, at Burberry to um, give yes. you a new logo yeah. mark and some other stuff, which we can take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, wow, picked it right first time. Yeah. Um, so t tell me about this project. This seems this like was it was probably a case of Ricardo coming to you wanting something of, of you rather than just yeah, a we, great new Yeah, in logo. the end, we, we got to there eventually. <laughs> um, and and Ricardo was really great actually I didn't really I didn't really know him I knew of him and, and I was pleasantly surprised that he knew of me um, I think he was probably a little bit uncertain because the, of the Britishness of Burberry and and he hadn't worked in in specifically in the UK mm -hmm. and he's Italian obviously mm -hmm. and so I think he he felt it appropriate to to bring in a certain kind of British awareness um, and and he was very engaging with me and and 
and he sort of he wanted my help on interpreting Burberry and Burberry was not something that I had a particularly strong opinion about um, I had some opinions about what I thought Burberry ought to be I had some opinions back in the 80s before before the renaissance of Burberry about you know what it should be um, but when I had to sit down and focus on it, um, I was able to to uh, I was able to propose to Ricardo my reading of Burberry. Um, I wish he responded to really well. The 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 most telling moment in the project came when we sat together we, we sat in a room at Burberry surrounded by vintage Burberry labels that they had found in the archive and they were looking at um, and there were dozens of them and he said to me Peter finding the way to write Burberry in a trench coat is not so difficult and sitting in a room full of them I had to agree no it's not very difficult he said but the same he said the same lettering in a chiffon blouse that's my problem hmm. and uh, in a somewhat camp way I just had to say I know exactly what you mean dear um, and but uh, but he put it but he he he, he actually had put it really well that was the problem that was his problem he was there having to in a way build from the base that Burberry had and build out a kind of comprehensive clothing collection that and find a way to write Burberry yes in a trench coat but also in a chiffon blouse mm. so I, I said thank you and and I went away I, I went away contemplating the ways in which you, you could read Burberry as sexy and that will lead us to that picture you've got the lady in the field not that one that one <laughs> see that was that was that's my version of sexy Burberry tell us about well it's a lady in a raincoat cover. I mean it's, it's a lady in a raincoat on the cover of Atom Age Atom Age was an occasional journal published by a man called was John Sutcliffe I think John Sutcliffe John Sutcliffe who was a couturier in London in the 60s and 70s of leather and rubber and you know he actually made the outfits for, for I think for Diana Rick for the Avengers and I think that we formative experiences in my youth um, and, and I you know I came across Atom Age magazine on the shelves of a you know of a late night shop in Soho at some point you know in 1980 um, and I was kind of fascinated by the culture of it it's so weird I mean you know um, it's unusual um, that part of one's learning curve and so you know the Burberry the trench coat itself can be interpreted as you know sexy mm -hmm. um, so so for uh, one of my I have a um, I have a great graphic designer and these days typographer that I work with called Paul Hetherington who is a um, similarly corrupt individual and and um, and I said to Paul I think this could go a little bit atom age mm. and he 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 knew exactly what I meant straight away um, and it led to led to rubberist let's have a look at rubberist so um, the, that the lettering there for rubberist is not a million miles away from where the Burberry logo ended up no <laughs> um, and it's a little bit Range Rover <laughs> A little bit early Range Rover, and these were the these were the kind of this this was the this is the semiotic content that went into that bit of lettering. And I'm actually very pleased with the Burberry logo. Let's go back to the real thing. Let's not upset people any longer. Um, <laughs> I'm actually very pleased. I mean, it was a gift of, of, of a logo to do. Um, how many letters are there? Eight letters. They're all a fairly similar shape and size. Um, and I'm actually just realizing an anagram of rubbery. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's, it's quite rubbery itself. Good one. Nice. Yeah. And, nice one. And, um, <laughs> Um, see, type. <coughs> so I find it a bit. I find it a bit boring to talk about now. Typography oh, was very exciting to me forty-five years ago. In 
What had happened in the 70s with graphics was that <laughs> Uh, the prevailing the prevailing school of thought in graphics in the 60s and 70s had become that of the kind of New York school of the visual pun. So uh, Milton Glaser, Saul Bass, etc. So communicating through a smile in the mind, they used to say, um, you know, communicating through some wit. And, and, and in the course of that, the look of things kind of got left behind a little bit, in my opinion. And, and by the time I was at art school in the 70s, I found these sort of these visual puns a bit tedious and they didn't tell me much about the thing in question so it might be a logo it might be for a restaurant and you know seeing a bite out of a plate um, <laughs> doesn't tell me anything about the restaurant you know what I mean it doesn't yeah. tell me what kind of restaurant it is and 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 so in a sort of um oh, what should we call it post-war socio-cultural democratization you know as a teenager in the 70s I was beginning to want more mm. I was beginning to have aspiration I was beginning to um experience the culture of living um, and so it mattered to me what things looked like and and how at least with gra the graphics course I was on and the graphics I was studying how that might communicate the feel of things so basically um, what were the what were the semiotic elements that would become the ingredients of communications design and of course I, I realized you know one day at college that that typography was the kind of quintessential semiotic element in communications design that you could do an awful lot with typography mm. and 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 so in a way I discovered it for myself um, in the college library one day in like 1977 um, so I suddenly consumed a lot of information about type yeah. and used type in a little tiny bit more sophisticated way than was generally the case certainly in pop culture I mean uh, I, I thought it was good at the time but when I look back at some of my early record covers now I think it was not very good at all but it was you know better than the rest um, and so you know for some time people thought I was a typographer and some people still do think that but I'm not at all and, and I find it a bit tedious now. There are thousands of people around the world now quite obsessed with it. Yeah. So I, I can't really be doing with it. But it is important. And if you're doing something like this, it's very important to have someone alongside you who is obsessed with it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if, in fact, it seems extremely important these days because I, I, I have to guess that the amount of type that we ingest daily yeah. has increased the exponentially. Thing is, yeah, the we, we are reading all, constantly. Yeah, the problem is it's all nice now. <laughs> you know, I mean, yes. You see, an interesting thing, but if you drip feed better into pop culture, it connects with people. It's a great disseminator. Mm. So. typography became entered in a way the kind of the, the, the public domain um, through pop culture yeah I mean as a as a as a course at art college it was really boring <laughs> but once you started to see hip things with a conscious application of type, then people began to get kind of interested in it. Yeah, but and, and it also seems that a, like as a necessary downstream effect of that, something that is hip, something that is avant-garde, will lose potency as it becomes. They do as it becomes popular. Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying to you earlier, there's sometimes ah, yes. where I, I feel. Uh, 
mm. mistrustful of good graphic design. Uh, me too. When I'm selecting a restaurant, I kind of yeah. want to go to the place, but the sign looks like shit. Yes. Because I, I think I've, the food might be I've considerably better. I've become distrustful of the whole thing. Yeah. So designer hotels, cafes, bars, coffee bars, the whole thing. Yeah. If you see somewhere that looks particularly good, it probably isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of it, they, they all look like kind of test tube creations now of a branding and marketing department or a marketing sensibility of, you know, you know, uh, a chef. Um, there are whole like carbon copy shops that open up in the ground floor retail opportunities of development and they will have terribly nice logos and they all have terribly nice shop windows and they have terribly nice fits they, they have all of these signifiers um, that are so um, uniform and of a certain quality that that lacks any authenticity now. Mm. So, I mean, it's just, it's just the constant chasing of one's tail. So we are in, in varying stages seeking signals of authenticity. And that's a moving target. Mm. So authenticity 25, 30 years ago might have been um, something that looked like it had been done properly. Um, something that looks like it's been done properly is now a, a signal of, 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 of likely insincerity and gratuitous um, uh, marketing positioning. So, so we're constantly trying to, to read um, something we believe. Hmm. I want to stick with Burberry a, a, a little bit because in addition... you got a tram. Hmm? you got a tram picture. I do, and I'd like to ask you about it. Uh -huh. um, so in addition to the logo, you also... I, I didn't do that. Hmm? So the... <laughs> but this was... <laughs> Someone obviously did it, though. I, I, you, you were involved I think in, it's in, a real re, in, re, in refinding the... The, um, the monogram I think itself. it's a real picture. No, it mean, is. It, it, this was part of the... Yeah, the They're monogram, it's interesting that the, the, in the quest for a new way to write Burberry, there was also, oh, can we have a monogram as well? And, and by chance, Paul and I came across the makings of a new monogram in some of the archival material. And, and, and it, it, I mean, be careful what you wish for. It worked better <laughs> than we ever imagined. And the Burberry studio went further with it than... I ever imagined was possible, and quite clearly, all the all the way over a tram, um, and 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 the the e-commerce that I get from them every other day still has this little TB on it. Everything's yeah. got TB on it. I mean, I, I mean, there's almost nothing that has not had a TB put on it in the last five years. Yeah. Um, but it is quite good. The TB it works. Things like this are amazing because. You do something, and then other people do stuff with it. Mm. And sometimes that you cannot necessarily control. Not a control at all yeah. anymore. I mean, in the early years, I used to think you could control it, but you can't control it. And um, I mean, on the internet, I mean, out there on the net, there is a huge amount of bootleg variations of things I've done. So I've been seeing kind of, in a way, bastardizations of my work for 40 years. Um, you know, even with record sleeves, by the time it got to a, a, a one of the further flung regions, um, uh, the, the record company distributing the music would have made all, all sorts of um, um, alterations to the cover. You know, they put a picture of the band on and things like this. So I got used to that early on. Um, but I got used to things being terrible. <laughs> but these days they're pretty good. And, and, and you think, I wish I'd done that. And, and people think you did. Hmm. So, so with Burberry in particular, I mean, it's been a little bit blanket coverage. But most of what they've done is amazing. Hmm. And, and people think I did it. Which is fine. Um, so it's just what happened. Well, you, you obviously did enough enough here to yeah. to uh, I never give thought. someone the idea to wrap wrap yes. a tram. But they've wrapped all kinds of things in there, and they've had it up buildings in Hong Kong and things like that. How do you feel about that? How do you? What well, is exciting to see it out? Well, it's hilarious, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I've seen London taxis with it on. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, it's just, well, it's meaningless excitement. Hmm. It's just what it is. I mean, <sighs> Burberry is quite a good one because it is quite good. As I said earlier, <laughs> that Burberry logo is quite good. You know, when I drive down Bond Street and see it, it on a building, I think, thank God, it's okay. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, we all make mistakes and sometimes we do work that is not as good as other work. Mm. And it's painful when you see that rolled out in front of you every 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 week but fortunately the Burberry project went quite well and their implementation of it has been spectacular I mean quite often if I'm at Heathrow Airport Terminal 5 there will be a billboard the size of this room with Burberry stuff on it and I think it's pretty good <laughs> so, so it's okay you know it's okay yeah. but, I mean the every this is a problem graphics it, most of it's really good now Beer bottles are good, <laughs> you know? Um, most of it, I mean, not all of it. There's shocking things, but there's so much out there that is really good now, and that's one of the problems, because and that's why we don't believe in it anymore. Yeah. I want to go back a bit to some of um, what helped you shape your sensibilities. There okay. was an image we talked about a long time ago. Because it's uh, interesting that the... the the longer this has gone on, and I have to sort of, I apologize saying well, it, the older I get, <laughs> it gets more difficult to talk about. Mm. I mean, it's like 45 years. Yeah. And I'll try. Go on. Hmm? I'll try to. Do. Oh, that. Well, what I hope to ask you about it oh, yeah, again Malavich. is, I'm, I, I'm curious because. That it, was a good moment. <laughs> Tell us about it. No, no, go. No, no. I was. What I was going to say was that it, 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 it's, you know, you have, it seems you've cultivated instincts, intuition, sensibilities about what will work in, in the context. But I'm, I'm curious about more about how you began to develop okay. the, the tools to make the connection. Okay, so it, we're in a, in a, we are in a college and it's an appropriate place for this, to, to mention this. Um, so the, the visual sensibility that I absorbed in my early and mid-teens was a kind of post-pop glamour. Mm. Um, lots of kind of, you know, neon and shadow lettering and things like that. And, you know. um, airbrush illustrations. Roxy music covers. Okay. And then punk happened. And as I said earlier, punk was like a coup d'etat in, in youth culture. Um, and and it, it did seem... It was temporary, but it seemed at the time permanent to have rendered obsolete everything that came before. Um, through a kind of a, um, almost a phenomenal misdirection in education, my friend Malcolm Garrett, who I'd been at school with, spent a year at Reading University attempting to study graphic design. And that was a mistake. And he left Reading and came and joined me at Manchester Polytechnic. <laughs> um, he brought with him, though, one extraordinary thing that we did not have at the Polytechnic. He brought a reading list. Reading being a university, they had a reading list. Um, so even for graphics, they had a reading list. And, and a thing like a reading list was not anything that anybody talked to us about at, at, at college. And as I said, the prevailing idiom within graphics was the kind of school of visual puns. But Malcolm turned up with um, effectively a reading list, which constituted what the brief canon of graphic history and where it had its inception in early 20th century modernism in particular. And Malcolm started to reference that graphic canon in the work that he was doing at college. And it seemed, it just seemed phenomenally correct. It just seemed right. And particularly in 76, 77, during the, the pop coup d'etat. And particularly the work done by the Russian constructivists. Um, and in, in, a, in a preposterous way, 
um, a preposterous manifestation of our imagination, um, Malcolm and I likened ourselves in the kind of post-punk moment to, to being the constructivist designers after the revolution in Russia and the, the, the trains that took the message of the revolution across, across, across Russia. And, and um, uh, particularly Lizitsky and, and his colleagues and the, the way that they, in a way, turned upside down, the they literally turned upside down the printing press, you know, in a kind of post dadaist way. And, and we, we kind of, uh, we found uh, this sort of analogous moment in that, in this, in this sort of um, post-punk dawn. And, um, and there was one great anthology book called Pioneers of Modern Typography by Herbert Spencer. And I, and I picked it up on Malcolm's desk and I said, can I borrow this? And he said, no, he said, get your own. <laughs> and I was like, where? <laughs> And he said, well, you could try the college library. And I said, where's that? And he said, fuck me. He said, Peter, you've been here three years. It's that big building in Oxfordshire. I said, do you think they'll have it? And he said, I don't know, go look. Anyway, so one day in early, no, late 77, September 1977, mm. at Malcolm Garrett's uh, uh, instruction, I went to Manchester Polytechnic Library. And they did have pioneers of modern typography. And more than that, they had an entire bookshelf of the brief canon of graphic history and its, and its, its sort of segue out of modernism. Um, and the fascinating, fascinating thing was nobody had ever taken the books out. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I assembled this great, as many as I could carry. And, you know, there's a little card. There used to be cards inside library books. and had, I mean, you know, some of them had never been out. In fact, I still have the Piet Zwart book that never been out. <laughs> um, nobody had ever taken it out. The, the library had had it for 10 years, and nobody had ever taken it out. Um, so I thought no one's going to miss it, so I kept that one. <laughs> anyway, I, w I went back to the college refectory with this big mountain of books in front of me. And somewhere, among, in, somewhere amongst those books was Malevich's Black Square. And I was, let's see, 77. I was like 21, 22. And I didn't really have any art history knowledge at all. Hmm. At school, we'd done the history of architecture rather than the history of art, which was in a way abstractly helpful. And I looked at the Black Square and realized that I knew nothing because I knew it was important. Mm. I mean, you just know it's important, but, but you don't really know why, but you know it is. And that was the point at which I realized that I didn't know anything and that I ought to start to learn. And, and I remember distinctly that that was the day that my actual real education started. Mm. It starts the day that you want to learn as opposed to the received curriculum or whatever that you get you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a young person. You know, you absorb certain things, thank God we do. But then there's a point at which where you, where you want to learn, and that's the point where you start to learn. And the black square was the point that I started to learn. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> the worst thing is the more you learn, the less you know. So I mean, <laughs> I'm just, I'm a bit confused these days. But your, your, your practice from this point and then, and then onwards has involved, a, it seems to be, a lot of research and, and finding things and recognizing the potential in them. Um, yeah, and it was all then, historic for, you, for a decade or so. Yeah. It was retrospective. But as you continue your career, you start working with Yoji Yamamoto in, mm. I think, the mid to late 80s. And, yeah. um, How are we going to do that? Okay. <laughs> so the thing, the thing was, that, and the reason it was retrospective, just before we move on, is that I looked in, I looked in, in those books that I took from the library that day, and, and, and I was really angry. I was upset. Uh, when I saw when I saw the brilliance of thinking and ideas, uh, particularly um, in, in aspects of art and design, uh, well, design and architecture, of things of the application of thought to how we live, and I looked outside at 1970s Manchester, I was very disappointed. <laughs> I, I was I was angry that so little of 
So little of the brilliance that had been proposed during the, during the century, so little of it had ever been implemented. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and how mediocre and shabby it all was. So in in weirdly my my personal sense of punk dissatisfaction as a kind of middle class bourgeois kid with nothing much to complain about, my sense of 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 of, of anger was to do with the. Um, the kind of the paucity of everyday life. Hmm. You know, you you look in a uh, you look in a Bowers book, and you look at a bus ticket and think, fucking hell, why? You know, why why can't a bus ticket bring like a, a value, bring quality to my day? Why can't any of it bring quality? Hmm. You know, why can't a bus stop be better? Why can't a bus stop? enhance our sensibility about living it's about civilization and it really disappointed me that there was so little of the the the, the canon of culture that, that was thought relevant to everyday existence mm. so so for the first few years i was reintroducing things that i thought mattered through the free autonomous medium that I had of the record sleeve. I mean, it was, you know, no one was asking me to do a bus shelter, but they were asking me to do a record sleeve. So I was communicating the things I wanted to communicate, mm -hmm. or I was sharing the things that I wanted other people to see. Um, the extraordinary thing is that the context of music made them cool. That was the key thing. It was the fact it was on a record sleeve made it cool. So they were kind of like pre-cooled, like the Fantin Le Tour. I mean, no one really cared about 19th century floral still life painting, but you put it on a new order cover and then everyone thinks it's fucking amazing. So, uh, or interesting or cool in some way. So pop culture is, is, can be a very empowering medium to do useful things with yeah. if you get the opportunity. So no one was asking you to do a bus shelter at that time. No, but, later. But in did. fact, you, you did do one later. Yeah. But Tell us about. No. no. no? What were you going to do? You were going to do. Well, I was going to ask you about some of the work you do with Yoji Yamamoto. Yeah, but let's do that first. Okay. We do Manchester at the end. So you, you, you moved to London in the early 80s. You begin working with Yoji Yamamoto. You find yourself in fashion. Yeah. I mean, um, when I came to London, that that... <sighs> That lack of connectivity between the disciplines still existed. Mm. So that kind of, you know, people people in their own little silo of their discipline. I was surprised. It was not a lot different in London, but the the kind of the 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 milieu that 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 kind of showed me friendship was actually a kind of fashion people in particularly in Covent Garden in, in the late 70s and I had the good fortune to meet a couple of people a guy called Tim Slack and Scott Crowler who I mentioned earlier who actually talked about about they were involved in clothing mm. and fashion but they talked about it in a broader in a broader sense of art and cultural history. So I began to learn from, I was, I was lucky, I met one or two people that I began to learn from. And you, you know, you learn to learn. But think back now about actually just how much influence certain people might have on you at a particular time that you don't you don't even know when it's happening but when i look back now i realize that there were certain people who who kind of they inspired they informed me as much as inspired me yeah anyway game over okay so game over is that what's on the thing yeah okay um they, this but was before the, you say that I'll yeah. say it, it's interesting as well you say but not knowing necessarily where the influence is coming from when it's arriving um in fact you your work has had that effect on quite a number of people who have gone on to do quite a number of impactful things in their own right just from seeing the covers yeah but unfortunately uh, i did just say it was the <laughs> context that that yeah. sorry i mean yeah the the there are these contexts through which you can connect with people yeah and they, they change it's obviously not record covers these i don't know if anyone sees a record cover these so it's other you know it changes but there are certain contexts within which you can connect with people i mean virgil was very good at finding that virgil was a great example of that yeah this was the game over. This was my first, this was my end of 80s negative moment. So by the late 80s, when there was a kind of a credit crisis and people had spent too much money on credit cards and the whole thing seemed meaningless. This was meaningless, meaningless excitement part one. Yeah. <laughs> and 
and would have been much the same for Yoji early 90s Japan. it was exactly the same for Yoji yeah in fact Yoji made a women's collection made out of wood wood and tin foil as a uh, it's kind of it was almost like just don't push me like he, he he wanted to not do a collection and yet the company made him do a collection so he made a collection of unwearable clothes <laughs> I mean literally they were made out of wood um hoping that no one would buy them. The funny thing is architects bought them. <laughs> <laughs> the architects bought them and they hung, found them, his audience. They hung them. They hung them in their studios. Yeah. It was cool. So um, so there was a women's collection that was made out of wood and that I, I, the, that was, I did that with fashion. But there was a men's collection before and the, and the men's collection, I mean, he, he used Vargas girls and things like that on leather jackets and, and they asked me, could I do something? Yoji specifically said to me, Peter, Will you do me? Will you do me a visual campaign the way you do your record sleeves? No models, none of the clothes. Uh, just an abstract response to this. Hmm. Um, and my feeling about it in the, whenever this was 1991 was like, you know, you don't need, you, no one needs this. And I knew that Yoji thought no one needs it. That's why he made those, those dresses out of wood. Um, so I, I gathered, I gathered post-pop, pop imagery. I sat one down one day and, and because of this quotation, a pop quotation he'd made in some of the garments uh, for men, I just sat down one day making a list of all of the things that were the ingredients of pop paintings like custom cars. <laughs> Tigers, leopards, uh, glamour girls, swimming pools, you know, the signs. Um, and with a certain ironic sensibility that I had not had previously in the 80s, I started using photo libraries because they were so wrong they were right there was no need in the 80s if you wanted if you wanted to ironically in a way quote the 70s you didn't really need to take a picture you just needed to go to image bank and they had loads of it so everything everything that i had previously detested suddenly became this amazing treasure trove of useful stuff mm -hmm. so so i sent out like shopping lists to the photo libraries and send or send me all your swimming pools and all your <laughs> custom cars and sat down um, i didn't have the confidence to kind of write anything but i went to look for questioning phrases, so I kind of looked through B movie titles and 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 um, anywhere I could find lists of phrases, and in a kind of I guess in a sort of Jenny Holzer type way, Barbara Kruger type way, and um, and I found you know a few dozen phrases that I liked. And, and 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 printed them out and cut them up and then I found and then I took the images that came in from the photo libraries and then I just started to put phrases with pictures and and game over seemed quite good on this hot rod yeah so that's how I did them all and 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 of course um, Yoji liked it Mr. Saito the president of the company did not like it at all <laughs> And he called me in and he said, does this mean Yoji is over? And I was like, hmm. oh, no, 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 no. Uh, the company will garner respect from the audience by acknowledging that it's thinking the same thing they're thinking. Hmm. And Mr. Saito said, you better be sure. <laughs> um, so, I mean... So you uh, it successfully did find a bit of now. It, it kind of worked. The, it, interestingly, the American distributors of, of the collection refused to support the advertising in any way. Yeah. They, they, this, so this is 91, and they said that a, a fashion advertisement that did not include the garment... <laughs> Oh, unthinkable. Unthinkable <laughs> was entirely pointless, uh, counterproductive, and that they would not support it. So there was n no advertising in America because they wouldn't support it. Um, I mean, later that year, Yoji wandered off on tour with an acoustic guitar. <laughs> uh, he came back eventually, but but you know, he and I like Yoji. <laughs> Yoji, Yoji is like he—he is—he is actually the real deal. Yeah, he is Zen-like, and he doesn't care. Yeah, 
Um, the real business is called Wise, Y apostrophe yeah. S, and Yoji Yamamoto is a kind of indulgence that that made the Japanese market more keen to buy Wise things. Yeah. So Yoji Yamamoto label was always a certain artistic license for Yoji, and. Um, and you can talk honestly to him and 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 and, and he he talks honestly back yeah. and and he made it quite clear then he didn't really care and he wanted me to in a way communicate that he didn't really care yeah i found it quite funny years later seeing this campaign which is very critical um appear in a totally commodified mm. fashion See, um mean, these are supreme t-shirts mean, well, meaning that came this, out a couple of years meaning ago meaningless excitement I mean, the thing is that that 90, what the Game Over campaign and the fashion one that followed yeah. it, I, I don't know if anyone got it. I mean, obviously some people did get it. And here we are like 20 years, no, 30. Yeah. <laughs> don't think about it too much. It's 30 years ago. Wow. 30 years later talking about it. And it looks quite good. I mean, I like it. Um, Supreme thought it looked pretty good a couple yeah. of years ago. And, you know. Do, do you think much at all about when you see your, your work reproduced in this fashion? Or is it just, it is what it is. It's a great graphic. That's sort of what's most crucial about the whole enterprise. It's like ego reincarnation. Hmm. <laughs> I've not said that before. <laughs> When, when hipsters, <laughs> when younger hipsters, and not that they're young anymore, they are already themselves probably a bit old now, but, but when, when a younger generation turn up and s say or tell you that something you did before is cool, <laughs> or they like it, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you said earlier tonight you were surprised, delighted to see a room this full of people that want to come. I am Do you not I think genuinely, perhaps it's because you expressed a sense of disaffection that, that, that people still connect with? Is, is it maybe I mean, just the message no, I have was, to say honestly, Adam, really honestly, I, when I said I was touched that all these people are here, I am touched that all these people are here. Yeah, I, I mean, there it. are some I older people... <laughs> Um, how they got here, I don't know, but um, <laughs> but there are there are younger people, and I mean whether they get anything from this talk or not, I don't know. But the fact that they even bothered to come is is nice, okay. you know. Well, I think it's it's no small feat, and 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 yes, a lot of it has to do with context and timing and happenstance. But to have put something into a, a, a shared visual lexicon that people recognize and connect to and, and respond to viscerally without even really needing to know what it is, is quite something. Um, yeah, and there's more attention to it now. I mean, I suppose yeah. this is one that there's, there's much more interest in it all now. A lot, a, a lot of things that were done, not just by me, but by everybody else in the 70s, the 80s, even in the 90s, no one really cared. Mm. And, and there is a, a lot more curiosity now, so the, which is great. And pop, you know, I mean, it's a quite brutal cycle to be in. I mean, the, I mean, I was lucky to be kind of like hip in the 80s. And then I went to give a talk. I was invited to take part in a talk in Amsterdam in the early 90s. And already the next generation of hip studios there was um a uh, fuel um i can't remember what the names are now um um already the next generation were through and they were in a way that the they were like headlining the talk and i and i got invited as well and and i i didn't feel old yet i was only like approaching I'm 40 or something but I felt like the last big thing mm. um tomato that was the other studio um and there's nothing worse than being the last big thing I mean this can apply to anybody in 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 anything they do um yeah it's really awful being the last big thing 
Yeah, you want to be. If you, it's better to be a big thing a few things ago because then it means yeah, you're about to come back but, around. But it's 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 because you know you get arrogant and and egotistic and you just think that you're like it and then you're not and then you're really not. Yeah. <laughs> and and so you know and that's it's quite bruising. Yeah. Um, and I went tentatively, tentatively to this talk in Amsterdam because I, I just felt like I was some sort of gratuitous old guy that they were taking along. But then they were all very nice and they sort of um, said, well, in, if you hadn't done what you had done, we couldn't uh, be doing what we do. So actually, we don't mind you. So come along. <laughs> so so I, I kind of felt like, um, you know, the, 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 the trendy uncle that kids don't mind having. <laughs> um, so it is, it's not easy staying in touch with or being part of any sense of, of, of what is happening now. Hmm. And there are so many things about now that I'm totally detached from and completely arm's length from, hmm. as you know. Um, so if if there are some things that you have done at any point, whether it was yesterday or whether it was like 30 years ago, that still that have any resonance or any relevance to, anywhere, relevance to anyone or to a next generation, then that is actually a very nice feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I mean, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I think I interviewed Mike Murray once for a piece I was writing about you mm -hmm. and he said, Peter did something which could stay. That's nice. That's nice. Way. And I mean, Virgil was nice. I mean, I mean, you know, Virgil, uh, you know, Virgil was a um, an extraordinary feeling, you know, because he was out there in a very different world, and with entire other generations, and 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 well, that's how we met. We actually met at a Virgil Abloh event, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. So. How long did it take before you started noticing some of the work you did, like the unknown pleasures cover and things like that, to become um, to become tropes dissociated from? Um, well, yeah, we have well, a great has. image for it here. Where should we start? Hold on, not Where with the it? glory hole. Please. No, no, no. We'll get there. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. When did this? Oh, when, did, when did you start noticing this happen? What is this? It, it, can everyone see it? It says, <laughs> "I've seen it on Tumblr." Okay, that is a brilliant T-shirt by a guy called Adam Kurtz. Adam J. Kurtz, hmm. probably from Williamsburg. <laughs> one, one of those. One of those clever, clever Americans. Um, well, uh, Joy Division is a special case. Um, it's a, it's really, it, it's really a cult of romantic tragedy that, yeah. that you know, it starts with Ian, um, and the kind of the Shakespearean tragedy of Ian and Love Will Tear Us Apart. And, and how do I often put it? Last true story in pop, or one of the last. So, so the Ian Curtis story is one of the last true stories in pop. You know, pop doesn't have much truth. And, and, and when there have occasionally been glimmers of the truth, they've then usually been um, discredited or devalued subsequently. And there are people you think amazing, and then a few years later you think not so amazing. So, um, and I don't know what would have happened with Ian, but he died. Um, and, you know, he wrote some songs and he wrote, well, various songs. And, and, and he kind of underscored them ultimately with his life. Um, so to anyone wondering, did he mean it? I mean, you have to kind of say, well, yeah, he did mean it. Um, and, you know, people write sad love songs all the time and they say, I can't live without you, but somehow they managed to carry on living. And, and, and Ian didn't. And so this very powerful, tragic, romantic cult has emanated around Joy Division. So it starts there. It, does, it doesn't really start with an image. It starts with... Ian's writing meaning something to certain to people. 
Um, and then that image then somehow becomes intrinsically linked to that cult because, as you said right at the beginning, uh, I did work that supplanted personal pictures or personal imagery with a, a, an, an abstract. You know, as I said, you know, nobody at Factory wanted to be a pop star. Nobody wanted to be on their record covers. Nobody wanted to be a pop star. So they were very happy for an abstract interface between um, themselves and the music to, to, to appear. So, so I provided this sort of abstract interface. Um, so this image comes is it like a kind of it's a, it's a it's a symbol of the cult of joy division yeah it's a kind of it's the crucifix of joy division in a way and and as such people have you know had it tattooed upon themselves you know many times you, you see in many places context, all the time yeah i mean when you see somebody with their entire back with that image tattooed on it you you see a real commitment now it's <laughs> It's not. It's not a gesture of commitment to certainly to me or to to to, to Justin Belbanel and Hal Craft who who were responsible for discovering the pulsar. It's yeah. not. It's not a tattoo about astrophysics. It's a tattoo of commitment to um, a feeling that somebody so profoundly expressed in their writing. Yeah. But. Um, as a as a kind of as, as a contemporary late 20th century icon that somehow has spread out across the world it is phenom phenomenal i mean it's my yeah. first it's the first album cover i did and and you know and i see it every week yeah somewhere or other i yeah. see it every week um I mean, it was a funny thing. I, mean, I gave a, a talk about this time last year in Madrid, and um, they gave me a prize, and so I went to Madrid and, and a little chat. And, um, and they wanted to put me in a kind of designer hotel, and I said, no thanks. So uh, I, I went and stayed in the Ritz in Madrid. And it was weird the night I arrived. Um, the, the concierge was, or the man who opened the car, the taxi door was really nice. And the concierge made a real fuss of me. And I went upstairs to my room, and all of the mineral water bottles in the room had unknown pressures. <laughs> <laughs> And this, the, con the head concierge was like a, was a factory records fan. <laughs> and the, so the, the evening I got there, I got unknown pleasures water. The, <laughs> the, the next night, I got power corruption and lies water. <laughs> and as a leaving present, I got the first factory poster made out of chocolate. <laughs> So, which was amazing, actually. The pastry chef had made Fac One poster out of chocolate. It's really good. It's, 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 it's in the archive. Uh, uh, so, so, you see, so it's weird. You know, you check in the Ritz Hotel in Madrid uh, 42 years after you did something, and someone's made the mineral water bottles out of your sleeve. I mean, I mean it's weird. Yeah. Well... So this is a, a, another great one. Oh yeah. <laughs> now, so what? So what I'm what I'm very curious to ask you about about this image. I okay, mean, first of all, do, first I would like to point out this is from Adam's personal collection. <laughs> Beyond the, it's really the good. beyond the, the you know quite appropriate oh, joke it's so of, appropriate. of the image itself, I'm I'm also curious about the the commentary here, which is they gentrified the glory hole. I'd like to ask you, but what what do you think oh, the wow, the equivalence did. between this image and gentrification? I mean, to me, it makes me think of the the distrust of good design that I was mentioning earlier. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> Talk about, uh, oh, it's the expression, an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> wow, they gentrified. I mean, what they really mean It is, doesn't look like they've classed up the stall all that much. So. No. <laughs> um, no, not at all. I mean, in a way, what they mean, they've sort of kind of culturalized mm -hmm. it in that it's a... I mean, it's a slightly obscure cultural reference, mm. um, and probably. Oh God, I'm going to 
I put this? From a music point of view, it's probably associated with uh, some some intelligence. Hmm. In that, you know, some music quite proudly and plainly isn't. Uh, and I bet it's American. And the Americans probably think that Joy Division are intelligent. Because um, <laughs> they would. Um, <laughs> So I'm sure it's American, and yeah, someone thinks it's kind of intelligent. I mean, the funny thing about the image is that, you know, I mean, it's a very important scientific um, image of data. Um, there is a, there's a gentleman from Cornell University, Dr. Hal Kraft, a former president or vice president of Cornell. And I hope he never sees that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get it off the screen then. Um, th actually, so looking at this made me think of... All kinds of things. Well, <laughs> in particular, what it made me think of, where have I left this image? Bear with me here. Um, I need to open it up real quick. Which one is that? Second. Well, I was I thinking... Start, if you tell me what it is, I'll start talking about it before we see it. Well, what I was curious of asking about is I have been sort of bombarded with this Louis Vuitton <laughs> Yayoi Kusama oh, campaign. No. <laughs> and so I, I, I like to talk about it without passing any judgment on the, the collection, the campaign, the way it, it looks at all. But what I, I am curious about, and maybe this goes a little into the discussion of putting yourself into your work, uh, obviously, this is taking up a huge footprint in a city. I have not been able to avoid it online. But I'm curious to ask you about how much longer you think this style uh, well, I, yeah. of valorizing products with fine art will work. Well, I don't think Kasama has put herself into this for a start. Right? <laughs> and I'd only seen it in London, which yeah. was bad enough. Just some big... When, you, when, I, when, when, I saw, <laughs> when I saw that this morning... He sent me a thing to say, is it okay if I show this? And I saw that. I was just like, I was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Job and, done then. And what's our title called? A meaningless excitement in I the age so. of excess? I yeah. mean, well, I mean, we could just stop there, couldn't we? I mean, <laughs> what the fuck is that amount? <laughs> Well, it's shocking. <laughs> but 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 it seems. I mean, maybe it doesn't work. But they seem to keep doing it. Not just I this mean, brand, the, but every brand. The seems really to frustrating work. thing is that one or two of the classic Vuitton items actually look quite good for having the 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 the. the, the a slightly um, free form hmm. color dots on them. Yeah. And. <laughs> I mean, if you had one of those and Kusama herself had just taken it off you and put some things on, that would be amazing. But mass, what are you doing? You're mass producing irreverence. It's, so the, the lack of- I'm sort of so oh, exasperated no, 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 you. I'm sure, everybody, I'm sure everybody in the room, I'm struggling for words which don't have to be edited out of the film. Um, um, the, the, lack of, the lack of sincerity in it is overwhelming. Hmm. And I mean, one kind of wonders what Kusama's position is on these things. She's still alive. Um, when I saw a documentary about her a year ago, she's a little bit removed from things that are going on. Um, so, you know, so what does she think? Um, I mean, it's funny, but the sad thing is that I don't think that enough people are going to become curious about Kusama through the project. So, so I mean, I did say, say earlier on that you could drip feed awareness through pop culture. And, and that is true, but there has to be some authenticity to it. That's a belief, because otherwise people then, they just reject the idea and actually can be quite negative. Mm. If through doing some kind of collaboration, some more people became aware of Kusama and The, the interesting 
history and, and personality of her and the the fixation she has with dots and why she does what she does. So it's, it's not impossible for the kind of medium that, that Viton have, it's not impossible for that medium to be used to communicate something, to tell someone about something. But, you know, that, sadly, that is not their intention. Hmm. So enlightenment is probably not LVMH's <coughs> intention with this. And that's the problem. Yeah. Um, and I mean, where would it end? I mean, if like, so if we went back, I didn't, when did I do many excitement, meaning this excitement, 2014, whatever. So we, if, but if we went back 10 years and said, one day something like this will happen, you would say, you know, that's ridiculous, that can never happen. And it's happening. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where it stops. I don't know where it stops. And to be honest, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> well, at, at this time in my uh, history, hmm. it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of people in the room who, who have got to deal with this. <laughs> you know, I mean, many of, many of the people here are involved in the creative industry, applied art, whatever. Um, it, they, it's their problem. Um, you have to find the, the, you know, you have to find the alternatives, you know, and the other ways of doing things and, and, but you know, whatever you do to try to make things better, to ameliorate a situation, sooner or later, business will will find its way to co-op that and then you know then you have to start start again i mean the 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 heroic history of pop culture so back to elvis um seems to be a story of flight from capital you know so so a permanent flight from from people trying to make money out of other people and that seems to have been the 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 driver all, always you know that 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 um, there are some very boring people in the world who really can only think about making making profit in one way or another out of other people, um, and that's how they that's how they're kind of hardwired. That's how they are. That's what they're like. People just like make money, and there's other people who do things because they care, and 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 this is a story of a kind of. Um, the 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 um race trying to stay ahead of of um you know kind of gratuitous um uh capitalization you know you're trying to find and do something or say something that has some meaning to you and hopefully it might connect and have some meaning to others and and the 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 the, <clears throat> the forces of business that are always trying to co-opt that in order to make a profit so are you by the race you're suggesting saying that the the work that um might be worth doing is that which is far enough away that a company like vuitton looks at it and says, this is not commercializable. This well, game fit. over wasn't 30 years ago, but you know, yeah. it, so it gets there. I mean, but also, I mean, there's a, it's a kind of a close thing. There's a great David Bowie quote about being, there's no value, no point in being more than 10 minutes ahead of your time. So you, <laughs> you, 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 it's, it doesn't help if you're so far ahead that people aren't able to, 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 to be led by it or to, to see, to follow it in some way. So you need to just be there. I mean, the thing is, is that it's never a plan. Um, what you find or what I found, and this tallies sometimes with other people that I meet and work with or talk to, you, you do something that matters to you, and you don't know if anyone else cares. But somehow by making that gesture, by that kind of flare going up, you find that actually it does sometimes connect with other people and they feel the same thing. 
Um, and that's kind of how you address the things about the now that are unsatisfactory or offensive to you. You, 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 try, to, you try to do it a better way. <clears throat> And at first, you sort of feel all alone in that. But then by doing something, you find that, you know, more often than not, there are other people who feel the same thing. And, and, and that's, you know, that's why I sort of passed this problem over to the room. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't want to see this. <laughs> or if there is a collaboration with, with an artist, that it's done in a more meaningful way. And so therefore the only way to do that is to, is to, is to, is to propose those more meaningful ways by example and, and try to steer practice towards a position that you feel is um, more positive. It's basically to give. So I suppose that, that, that race I referred to is between givers and takers there's people who take and there's other people who want to give and um, that seems to be what keeps pushing things along yeah that feels like a nice place to, to end should we stop there okay yeah very good thank you so much everyone for coming thank you to the Savile everyone yeah, thank